Hey Rayleigh and anybody else watching and welcome back to another message from your father. Today, John 19 and 21. If you remember, we have been looking at um, Jesus's prayers. Yesterday was a big day of that. So Jesus's prayers for himself, Jesus's prayers for his disciples, and then Jesus's prayers for all believers. So future believers to come as well. Uh, beyond that, we looked at his arrest, Peter's denial, uh, Jesus questioned before the high priest, before Pilate. We're continuing that today, just as we've seen with the other Gospels, uh, Jesus' crucifixion and his death and burial. And then we'll see the empty tomb, we'll see Jesus' appearance, a miraculous catch of fish, and then finally um, we'll look at Jesus' message to Peter. Now keep in mind, again, this is after Peter has denied him three times, so Jesus is going to be asking him three questions. So we'll look at that uh, 19, 20, and 21 of John today. So, chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in pur a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail to the king of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was, given, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Golbatha. It was the day of pe preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Jesus, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here, one on each side of Jesus and in the middle. Oh, excuse me. Uh, here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side of Jesus in the middle. Pilate had noticed prepared, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that scripture might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a son the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. <clears throat> when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, <clears throat> excuse me, with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies to be left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man, who had been crucified with Jesus, and then the other. 
But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another scripture that says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Um, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the bodies away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two men, uh, or the two of them, wrapped it with the strips in with the spices in the strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, "'Woman, why are you crying?' They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this time, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where they have put him, where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus turned to her and said, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have, you may have life in his name. Chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathanael, from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go out with you. So they went out and got into the boat. 
but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they had landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but... Even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciples, disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. Only He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even a whole, the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. What an amazing way to close that book. Uh, so we are going to be looking at Acts tomorrow, uh, but there was a couple things that I thought were interesting here. I think I'm going to just try and uh, limit it to one. We see uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. He denies Jesus three times. We see Jesus question him with the same question three times, almost covering up Peter's um, denials, almost each one of those, one for every denial. At least that's what it seems like. Um, Jesus forgives him. I mean, that's what it looks like. So Peter had denied Jesus and yet came back and Jesus forgives him. So that got me thinking a little bit about, um, about those that have fallen away. And I don't know if, if he had fallen away necessarily or if he was just too scared um, but again, that did get me thinking about people that have fallen away. Uh, so I wrote this down. Does this mean that uh, those fallen away can come back? Maybe something like the prodigal son uh, who have gone away, right? Does that mean that they can come back? Prodigal son would seem to indicate yes. Um, but also there is a verse, I think it's Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, um, that says it's impossible to come back to repentance uh, for people who have experienced the Holy Spirit and then walked away. So what are we left with? It seems like there could potentially be two different things. Well, that's a huge, that's a huge theological topic. And my prayer for you really is that you stay strong and that you focus on your walk with the Lord. I think there are a lot of these really big theological issues that people that are uh, great biblical scholars, they seem to take one side of the fence or the other. So I think that there are scriptures that you can look into that seem to kind of go both ways. Now, candidly, I I don't know, but my prayer for you is that you remain. Just as Jesus is talking and saying, hey, um, don't ask about him. <laughs> Focus on yourself and your salvation. I think that 
in that instance, that's the same, right? We, since we don't know the answer to that question, we are always going to point everyone to Christ, no matter what. There is no one that we should not be pointing to Christ. And my prayer for you is that you have that soft heart to do that. Those that say they used to be Christians and have walked away, uh, those that don't know who Jesus is, that you will have that heart, no matter what their past, to always point them back to Jesus. That is the very, very most important thing. Anyway, know that I love you, and that is my prayer for you. For anyone else watching, as always, I appreciate you so much, and I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.